the internet. What began as an exclusive tool to connect militaries, governments, and then universities has now, more than 60 years later, transformed everything about how modern societies operate and communicate. Today, no one can escape the grasp of social media or evade the mind-boggling connectivity that nearly all humans worldwide now have access to. But few have been prepared for what has also emerged with all this human connectedness. A new and ominous strain of human behavior has been unleashed. Increasingly, people are hiding behind a cloak of anonymity, waiting to provoke, harass, and even threaten anyone they choose. They are called internet trolls. <laughs> A troll is someone devoting large parts of their life to attacking um, other people on the internet, basically trying to make that other person's life miserable in some way. They send things to my home. It terrifies me to think what they could do if they wanted to, knowing exactly where I live, knowing where my children go to school. Trolls can be a minor annoyance or a life-crippling terror. But what happens if society tries to silence them? Who loses then? Trolling is a free speech issue. And if you aren't free to hate someone, then you're not free. I've been associated with all kinds of organized trolling groups. We're stretching the bounds of free speech. You either use it or you lose it. Feelings will be hurt. Politicians and the courts are now grappling with who really is a dangerous troll. I've been called troll by very powerful people that should know better. Homophobe, misogynist, racist, all this stuff is just lazy people not wanting to interact. Artist Gregory Allen Elliott is at the center of a landmark trolling case that might land him behind bars and forever change what any of us anywhere can or cannot say online. If Mr. Elliott is convicted of a criminal offense, watch out. Nobody will be safe. You better shut up, because if you don't, he could be going to jail. My name is Gina Crosley Corcoran. I write a blog called The Feminist Breeder, and I deal with a really steady onslaught of very vicious and dedicated trolls. Trolls can be really, really sneaky. When you think about patterns of stalking, stalkers don't just do it really quietly. They leave their victim clues that they're being stalked in order to scare them. So today I got a working person store magazine addressed to the feminist breeder with my home address. My trolls sent me this, probably to imply that I'm too lazy to find a real job besides blogging, so. Guys, hey, come here pumpkin pie. Gina's blog earns her family a decent income. She writes about being a stay at home mom but from a pro-choice, modern feminist perspective. And a large, active community of like-minded women has grown around her blog. I like to see that recognition response when someone else goes, oh, me too. And that's so validating. That's why I do it. Feminists are frequently <laughs> targeted by trolls. Gina knew to expect attacks, but she's been overwhelmed by the volume of abuse and stunned to discover who her trolls are. The trolls and the really dangerous people that I attract are themselves mothers and have small children at home. They get something out of taking out their frustrations on someone like me. They see me as a figurehead and they're really angry about the attention I'm getting from people and they want to discredit me in any way they possibly can. These people spend all day taking screenshots of every word I type on the internet. They all pick it apart. They talk about my children. They talk about my clothes. They spend an incredible amount of energy focusing exclusively on something that they claim to completely hate. 
And to me, that's the difference between someone who just disagrees with you or someone who is really stalking every move you make, and those are the trolls. Gina sees little difference between her trolls and a stalker. They want to see her react, and they know how to push her buttons. A stalker wants to upset that person. They want to make them afraid, and that's what these trolls do. They leave comments in such a way that makes you feel afraid of what they're gonna do and say. They'll leave comments about my address or my kids, and they do it because they wanna get a reaction out of me. They wanna see me lash out, and it all feeds into this sick and twisted entertainment value to them. So what is it that motivates trolls? In London, England, Psychologist Raj Persaud believes the internet has spawned an entirely new, yet unexplored, set of human behaviors. Psychologists and psychiatrists have been somewhat taken back by the huge amount of negativity there appears to be on the internet. And it may be that the internet has unleashed a kind of dark demon within millions of people out there in the general public. We think that one of the things that's problematic about the internet is it normalizes extreme behavior. So because you see a lot of people on the internet behaving in an extreme fashion, you think it's more normal than it might actually be. And the other thing is, is it seems to encourage a herd-like piece of behavior. If one person starts being negative and a group of people pile in behind them, there's a kind of cascade effect, which you don't see in ordinary life outside of the internet. Psychologists further believe that one thing has compounded the effects and numbers of trolls. Anonymity seems to be a very important factor on the internet in that it seems to make people less inhibited about doing nasty things. Um, it means that people feel free to get away with bad behavior because they think they're not gonna get called to account. No one's gonna point the finger at them. So the anonymity effect seems very important and may explain why so much dark and negative and extreme behavior occurs on the internet, but doesn't seem to occur in, in real life, in face-to-face -face interaction. But what inspires a troll? What do they get out of it? Operating out of an undisclosed location in North America, one hardcore and self-professed troll agreed to tell us, provided we maintained his anonymity. I'm Wild Goose, and I'm a member of the Bill Wagoner crew and I've done a podcast for the past several years documenting internet troll activity, hacker activity, Gamergate, Anonymous, Occupy, you name it, uh, I've been a part of it. There's a serious darkness in not only us, but I think in everybody online. I think a lot of people just don't tap into the, the power of anonymity and what it can do for them. When you're anonymous, you're free to do and say a lot of things that you otherwise wouldn't do in real life. You would be powerless to do in real life. Goose joined forces with like-minded trolls he met online, and they work as a team to offend and infuriate as many people as they can. If you were to Google Bill Wagoner crew, chances are you'd come across a term called rip trolling. When somebody dies, and their family puts up a memorial up in their honor. We might set up a separate page, or we might just go on that page and create a ruckus. Uh, but the idea is to get as many followers as possible on that page and make it seem as legit as possible so that we can offend as many people as possible when we start posting gore and other kinds of shocking material. Hounding people when they are most vulnerable, like at the time of a loved one's funeral, is a surefire hit for the troll. That's the easiest way for us to create a, a mass effect. It's really effective when you have all these, these people who are already emotional. You got this bomb on them, you know, with, with the gore photos, maybe some kind of sexually explicit photos. It just, it, it sends their emotions into overdrive. But what do the trolls get out of seeing these distraught reactions? Lulls. 
L-U-L-Z. That's the currency of the troll, and it's what they're after. Lulls are laughs, fun and amusement at the expense of others. The Wagoner crew will prod people online for reactions. The bigger their response, the more popular the target becomes. Someone who gets really animated and waves their arms around on camera, preferably, or they'll scream into a microphone on a podcast, they might start crying, they become a uh, lulz cow. They're, they're like an ongoing target. We love that kind of reaction. We want to make them cry. We love to make them cry. The open internet is a playground for goose and trolls like him. And the stark contrast to what they can get away with in normal society is not lost on them. I, I really can't. I mean, the, the real world's so uh, boring and it's lacking in lulls. It really is. I don't think we'd be able to find this in real life. The internet presented something that was never available to us before. Today, if you go on the internet, you're entering the domain of the troll. But where did internet trolling all start? This unassuming computer science professor may hold the answer and may himself be one of the very first trolls on the internet. I'm Dr. Adam Steele. I am an associate professor of computer science at DePaul University in Chicago. I think I'm the first recorded troll on the internet. Certainly not the first troll, but the first one that was actually written up. This is a piece that is here because my wife hates it, called The Alchemist. I hadn't really noticed, but it sure does look like a troll, and I guess he's stirring the pot. Adam would first access the internet while attending university in the province of Quebec, Canada. And it wouldn't be long until he was stirring the pot with his wry sense of humor. I was a grad student in 1993 at Concordia University in Montreal. Essentially at that time the internet was still very nascent and at that point was just a relatively small number of universities that were connected together and there was this kind of quasi bulletin board system called the News Network. You had, for example, a group like Rec.Humor and people would trade jokes and I guess what happened at some point was that there were people on Rec.Humor who had a certain penchant for tasteless jokes that was not appreciated by the rest of the community. And so the tasteless denizens were kind of hived off and started their own group, and Alt.Tasteless was born. As the chat group Alt.Tasteless got going, the jokes started to get more and more extreme. But soon, the jokes just couldn't get the rise they wanted. I think it was a long, hot summer, and everybody was kind of getting a little bored. And there was this idea that, that the people of Alt.Tasteless should invade a news group, and somebody suggested rec.pets.cats. Yes, cat lovers would be the next target, and Adam would be the lead. Like any community, they wanted to discuss problems that their cats had. So I guess my contribution was that we should actually engage them by writing a story that would appear to be from somebody who was genuinely concerned, get them to, to respond, a stealth attack. So I created a fictitious identity, and it was posted anonymously to Brack.Pets.Cats. And what happened next would be recognized by Wired magazine as something that had never happened on the internet before. I have two cats. Sudikin, two-year-old female, and Chode. Chode's problem is that he has really stinky shits, paint peelers. Adam's post was vulgar and over the top, but he took care to keep it believable. Sudi goes in to heat something fierce, yowling and presenting all the time. While dinner was cooking, I tried to stimulate her with a Q-tip because I had heard that one can induce ovulation that way. My date came into the bathroom while I was doing this, and needless to say, I don't think she bought my explanation. The cat lovers, however, bought Adam's story, hook, line, and sinker. The initial responses to the post were very helpful and essentially suggested that, that Sooty should get spayed. Then slowly, other suggestions started popping up. As the off-color suggestions became grosser and more extreme, 
the cat lovers were outraged, and the alt tasteless gang had a blast. So what we did was we essentially trolled, you know, where you throw a lure out behind a boat and motor slowly over the fish until somebody bites. Adam and the alt.tasteless crew had become the internet's first gang of trolls. Back then, Adam was one of about 14 million internet users worldwide. 25 years later, there are 3 billion people online, and the nature of trolling has evolved. What's happened now is that trolling has taken on a meaning different from the sort of fishing metaphor and more towards that of the troll under the bridge where someone will post something and the responses will be very destructive, basically laying waste to whatever's been said. In the early 1990s, Adam and his friends were trolling for fun. But now, negativity is everywhere on the internet. Back in London, Dr. Raj Persaud suspects that we all have a potential troll lurking in our psyches. The answer to the question of whether we're all potential trolls is delivered by a simple question. Have you ever gossiped negatively about someone else? Because if you have, there's a sense in which you were doing a kind of micro-trolling behavior. It's not pretty, but science has now proven that putting someone else down can make us feel better about ourselves. And there's a specific name for the feeling that results. The psychologists are taking an increasing interest in what's called the schadenfreude effect. And schadenfreude is a, a word from German, which is about feeling pleasure at someone else's downfall. There are a lot of people on the planet feeling low self-esteem, feeling beaten up by life. Maybe watching other people do badly, watching other people suffer, seems to correct your low self-esteem. Deriving pleasure from the pain of others is a characteristic we all seem to have to a degree. But psychologists are now finding that hardcore trolls are likely to express four dark personality traits. In Winnipeg, Canada, a landmark study of internet trolls has now shown that one of those dark traits stands above the rest, sadism. Sadists do it because they like it. Some people get their jollies by being uh, rude and obnoxious and causing harm to other people, sometimes serious harm to other people, and it gives them pleasure. Dr. Paul Trapnell and his colleagues have confirmed that the internet, with millions of potential victims and anonymity to hide behind, is a playground for people with sadistic tendencies. It's a venue where a person can go on and, and ruffle somebody's feathers or embarrass or humiliate them or make them feel anguish, and there is no consequence to that, and it's easy to do. So that might attract people that take pleasure in harming people, and that seems to be what we found. Trapnell and his team began their studies by focusing on people who frequently leave comments on message boards. A significant number of them unabashedly rated trolling as their favorite commenting activity. Then we asked them to also fill out a number of personality questionnaires, and those questionnaires included some measures of well-known, widely studied forms of nasty tendencies. We found, as expected, that the trollers were higher on all of the malevolent traits. It's not a stretch, but nobody had investigated that uh, with uh, data. And so we did so, and sure enough, that's true. Let me illustrate what I mean by these four dark tendencies that have specially toxic social consequences. Psychopathy, we can be callously indifferent by our reckless pursuit of things that we want. In narcissism, we are callously indifferent to others by our pursuit of grandiosity and wanting to hog the limelight, wanting to think that we are superior to other people. Machiavellianism, the pursuit of strategic harm in order to benefit ourselves. Sadism is a particularly malevolent way that we can do harm to others, and that is by seeking to harm people purposely because it's pleasurable to us. So all of us have the potential to be dark in these four different ways. 
And indeed, some people combine these tendencies in ways that make them especially dark, malevolent individuals. And that is a very, very malevolent person. This is not somebody that you want to have anything to do with at all. Definitely not. Nasty individuals have had free reign on the internet, and trolling is on the rise. But more and more people are starting to fight back. This accused troll has been forced off the internet for three years by a Toronto court. And today, his artwork has been forced off these cafe walls by angry protests. Gregory Allen Elliott is in limbo, awaiting verdict in a landmark Twitter harassment trial. When I used Twitter, I used it as a pure form. As an artist, I just went, this is a brush, this is some paint, this is a canvas. I used it to comment on politics. I used it to help people. And I just used it every way possible. One day, I, I responded to every tweet that came across my tweet stream. And then someone said, you don't have to respond to everything. And I said, I know, right? But today, I'm doing, that's what I'm doing as an artist and an experimenter. At one point, Gregory was sending 300 tweets per day. He was acerbic sometimes crude and very opinionated. Inevitably, he made some enemies who wanted to shut him up. Chris Murphy, Gregory's lawyer, explains how Gregory went from volunteering to design a logo for a feminist organization to being arrested and jailed for three days. When Greg called me, he had no idea why the police were there, and neither did I, obviously. And it wasn't until sometime after his arrest, when he was in custody, that he first learned what the police were doing there. And it turned out that there was a woman named Steph Guthrie who had said that Mr. Elliott had been criminally harassing her on Twitter. The medium that Mr. Elliott is alleged to have harassed the complainant, Ms. Guthrie, is on Twitter. That's it. Uh, no personal emails, not Facebook, nothing in person, no in-person meetings, no stalking behavior. There's the one they threw coffee on. You can throw coffee on it, but creating the picture is worth more than a thousand people destroying it. This is like freedom of speech. This is saying, you know, like, I can comment on what you're doing as long as it's not a threat. You know, if, if you're hurt, if the truth hurts you, it's not, it's not my problem because I'm just telling the truth. Mr. Elliott was disagreeing with Stephanie Guthrie's politics. She's the founder of a political organization in Toronto called Women in Toronto Politics. Mr. Elliott was an ally of hers for a number of months. But then there was a break in the relationship because Mr. Elliott stuck up for someone he believed was being bullied by Miss Guthrie and her friends on Twitter. Miss Guthrie, who refused to be interviewed for this film, asked her followers to, quote, sick the internet on a young man who had made an anti-feminist video game, a game that even Mr. Elliott admits was clearly offensive. There was an orchestrated and dangerous attack on this guy. Right up to that point, I was sending tweets to them saying, look, the guy only has 11 followers. Ignore it. It's not, it's not good branding you know, to destroy people's lives. But they said, screw you, Greg. And I said, OK, well, you're not going to take me seriously. Um, you're not going to stop. I sent a tweet that, I'm going to paraphrase it. It said, if you commit suicide, I'm holding you all responsible. And at that point, my helping stopped. The attack started, and I had to start defending. Gregory didn't know what he was up against. A community had labeled him a troll, and they were determined to get rid of him. I knew they were trying to get me kicked off Twitter. So at first, it was a campaign of intimidation. Second, it was fake identities using my face and names that were similar to my names, and, and that's illegal. And if I had felt like it, I could have got whoever did it kicked off Twitter. But then it was uh, the hashtag GAE hole, Gregory Allen Elliott asshole, so gay hole. So this was an orchestrated campaign that, that ramped up. Gregory fought back with tweets that were often abrasive and confrontational, but he never broke Twitter's terms of service. That hasn't stopped the justice system from charging him with criminal harassment and imposing bail conditions, taking away his internet use for three years. So what I've had to do for, uh, for the three years 
to, because I was banned from the internet and banned from email, is I've had to rely on family and friends and try and cut into their lives and schedules. Yeah, and to be forced back onto a pencil and eraser is, is very interesting. I've spent, I couldn't even count, th thousands of hours like this, sitting like this, out of my own time, because he was not able to do his own evidence gathering for his case. So you have to, the p most painful thing is having to go through stream of consciousness blather on Twitter. Not exciting for me, and I can imagine it's even less exciting for everyone that was helping me out, so. Sifting through the intricate web of thousands of tweets and retweets made one thing abundantly clear to Gregory's lawyer, Chris Murphy. Gregory Allen Elliott is not a troll. There's no way. He is either communicating a political message or he's defending himself against their slander. Those two things do not make you a troll. He wasn't going near them physically, wasn't saying anything threatening, wasn't saying anything sexual to them. He was communicating about politics and he was following the rules on Twitter. But because Gregory wouldn't shut up, his accusers went to the police, saying that they felt threatened. Now Gregory waits for the judge to decide his fate. Freedom or six months behind bars. If Mr. Elliott is convicted of a criminal offense, watch out, because nobody will be safe. What you're gonna do if you're involved in a political conversation online and the mob comes to shut you up, you better shut up. Because if you don't, you could be going to jail. Internet trolling has two essential parts, the attack and your reaction. A big reaction is what the trolls crave, and the way you respond determines whether or not you are a worthwhile target. If it's just somebody that's just gonna, you know, block us, and that's the end of the game, ah, well, you guys suck. That's, that doesn't provide too much entertainment. Prolific troll Wild Goose and the Wagoner crew are all about the lulls, the laughs their victims provide. They call them lulz cows, so there's a logical limit to how far they'll push them. There's a symbiotic relationship between the internet troll and the lulz cow. The Bill Wagoner crew has never pushed anyone towards suicide, nor have we tried to. That's never our intent. Why would we kill a perfectly good lulz cow? If we were to knock them off the internet or out of real life, what benefit would that provide us? You know, how are we going to get any lulz out of someone who's six feet underground? You know, um, last I looked, um, dead people don't come on the internet. Stay-at-home mom and professional blogger Gina Crossley Corcoran faces a politically motivated faction among her trolls. They disagree with her opinions on home birth, breastfeeding, and the healthcare system, and they want to drive her blog off the internet altogether. I have a large reach, but I don't feel like it somehow makes me better than anybody or makes me some sort of powerful figure, but they see it as very powerful, and that's why they want to shut it down. A few years ago, a coordinated trolling campaign drove away all of Gina's sponsors. There were a couple of brands that hung on, but ultimately they were like, listen, these people are flooding our Facebook page with negative comments and hateful comments and talking about our families now, and we just can't do it. So suddenly, almost overnight, I had no income base, but I had what had become an expensive blog to run. Gina took a chance and put up a paywall. Fortunately, it turned out that most of her audience was willing to pay to be part of the feminist breeder community. But the frustrated trolls have since stooped to new lows. One of them called the police and told them that I was committing suicide. So the police showed up at my house at like three in the morning, woke me up out of bed, and said, we got an anonymous tip that you are suicidal and we have to put you under a 72 hour psych hold. So I was being thrown in the back of an ambulance, crying, you know, upset, afraid my children were gonna wake up and see mommy being taken away. 
Um, luckily, I was able to talk to the EMT and I explained to him, like, listen, this person you're saying from Twitter, this person doesn't know me. Please don't take me anywhere. I have kids to wake up to in the morning. And luckily, he sort of saw the situation for what it was and he, you know, let me out of the ambulance and said, okay, go back to bed. So I found out from the police that anyone can make a call and say that they're worried about you committing suicide or they're worried about your children's welfare or, and anyone can make an, an anonymous tip. They don't have to leave their name. So there's really nothing legally speaking that I can do about that. My trolls realized that was a good way to use my own local police to harass me and get me out of bed at three in the morning. In the course of a year, it happened three times. So I went to the police and I said, this has to be illegal. And, you know, the local police's response was basically, well, if you don't like it, get off the internet. When the police cannot or will not help, there is another place that trolling victims can turn. Nice to meet you. Please come have a seat. The victims I deal with come to us very frustrated. They're frustrated with the situation because they feel helpless. Roman Horak is lead forensic investigator at InfoTransic, an international cybersecurity firm. He tracks down the trolls that law enforcement won't or can't find. The reasons why the police won't engage the case is because they won't believe there's enough of a serious threat or they won't have, the, the person themselves won't have enough evidence I've been getting a lot of people threatening me online, and it's scary. I'm not really sure what to do with this. What sites mainly are, are they threats coming through on? Mostly Twitter, but there's yeah. a couple on Facebook. OK. One of the big questions is understanding the motive of the troll. There's some trolls out there just scrolling the internet looking for someone random to you know, harass. Um, however, the vast majority of uh, trolls that we deal with are someone who they know that would have had a relationship somehow with the offender. Indeed, in the course of their investigations, Roman and his team have discovered that it is people we know, family and friends and workmates, who are most often behind the heinous attacks we can face. But Roman's team has also uncovered a new, more dangerous type of player in the trolling game. Professional trolls. Those who can be hired to settle a score and attack others for money. Online Trolls for Hire, the service is available online almost like a hitman. Some of the guys are very professional. They even create their own malware targeted to that victim. So they write their own code. They, they, these guys know what they're doing. These Trolls for Hire could be pretty much anywhere in the world, Romania or Ukraine, Russia, lots from there. Trying to track them down often becomes an international operation, having to coordinate between different law enforcements in, in different countries. But thankfully, the vast majority of trolls are outright amateurs who don't really know how to cover their tracks. About 85% of people who are doing these things, you know, trolling and uh, harassing people online, are not tech savvy. Most offenders are leaving a vast amount of digital evidence every day, on, I mean, every, every second, every minute right now. Pretty much everything we do online is potentially archived. Many trolls operate with a false sense of security about their anonymity and of the potential consequences they face if exposed. In England, the law has taken a hard stance and a line has been drawn in the digital sand. Yeah, I sent some tweets in 2014 and ended up getting a 12-week prison sentence for those tweets. It wasn't her habit to abuse people online, but today, Isabella Sorley is known as one of England's most notorious trolls. So, what was Isabella's online offense? In 2013, feminist activist Carolyn Criado Perez was campaigning to have a woman's face appear on the next printing of the English 10 pound note. The public reaction was largely positive, but she was also deluged by a torrent of abusive, irrational, and threatening messages on Twitter. Isabella joined that mob. That particular night, I was incredibly drunk. 
and I decided to go home and just send tweets. It wasn't about the campaign. I don't only really care what's on a British banknote. I know she was campaigning to have a woman and the Queen's on the banknote anyway, so I don't... I, yeah, I did really not care at all what she was campaigning about. Even now, I don't even know why I sent them. I would love to know why, and I'd love to give like a clear like, answer. But the real thing is that I was drunk and I've just jumped on the bandwagon and followed a lot of other people. The trolls were not debating. They were spewing hate and attacking Criado Perez personally for her feminist agenda. Isabella added six threatening tweets of her own. She threatened rape and worse. I woke up in the morning, like, obviously worse for wear, realized what I'd done. I was physically sick. I don't know if it was down to the tweets or just the hangover. I absolutely vile. Like, what I tweeted was disgusting, so to think that I actually typed that out, I felt disgusted in myself that I'd sent those specific words to another person. Filled with remorse the night after spewing her online hate, Isabella took to the internet to both confess and say sorry. I apologized to her, went, look, it is an empty threat, do not worry, I'm sorry. I don't know if it reassured her at all, but kind of it would made me feel a little bit better that, yeah, she's getting all these other rape and death threats. At least mine is an empty threat. She doesn't have to worry about me falling through with what I said. But rape and death threats are taken very seriously. Four months later, Isabella was arrested along with another troll. Her trial was widely publicized, and she faced the scorn of a nation. I got a um, 12-week prison sentence in Holloway Prison. It's hard. It was really hard, because obviously, like, how high profile it was, I couldn't hide away. I had all the prisoners asking why I did it. I had all, like, the prison guards asking why I did it. I was getting a lot of abuse from everywhere. I was being made out to be a woman here, and then obviously I'm in a woman's prison, so I was like, oh, dear. Now you got my head kicked in because of what someone had saw, what I'd tweeted on the news. I saw myself on Crime Watch in the prison cell, so that was hard. After her time in jail, Isabella was ordered to do community service and also pay money to Caroline Criado Perez personally for her online attacks. In England, Isabella Sorley's case was a precedent-setting one. A very clear message had been sent by the Crown, but not everyone agrees with the government's stance. I think trolling is a free speech issue. I think what we have is a situation where people are being prevented from saying certain things, often quite shocking things and, and not very socially useful things. You know, it's often just insults or abuse. But in my mind, that falls under the category of freedom of speech. And if you aren't free to hate someone, then you're not free. Brendan O'Neill is editor of the online current affairs magazine, Spiked. He's no stranger to controversy or trolling. Well, I've been attacked as an individual all the time. I get abuse, I'm defamed, I'm libeled. If I search for myself online, there's all sorts of abuse. And sometimes it becomes physical. I've had an envelope of human shit sent to this office. Um, so, you know, you get abuse all the time. If you put yourself out there, if you express an opinion, if you say what you think, you will get abuse. But in my mind, that's the price you pay for living in a free society in which everyone is allowed to express their opinion. Today, opinions are everywhere. But increasingly, tolerance of opposing views is not. It seems anyone can be attacked for saying anything remotely offensive. And the line between internet trolling and what is called public shaming is blurring. I guess in my definition, net trolls are like a kind of extreme, outrageous minority who will use kind of extreme language. With a public shaming, it's like nice people like us. We tear somebody apart because we're trying to be good, kind, empathetic people. And we're the ones who really do the damage because being torn apart by like tens of thousands of lovely people like us for a joke that lands badly on Twitter, that is profoundly and horrendously traumatizing. Best-selling Welsh author John Ronson thinks the social media pylons and the public humiliation that many of us take part in daily is out of control. 
take somebody like Justine Sacco, you know, who just before getting on a plane to Cape Town wrote, going to Africa, hope I don't get AIDS, just kidding, I'm white. And she chuckled to herself and pressed send and got no replies. Got on the plane, turned off her phone, fell asleep. Probably the last decent sleep she had in a year. Justine had only 170 Twitter followers when she posted her now infamous joke. But as she slept on that flight, the internet exploded. When she woke up and turned her phone back on, she discovered that she had lost her job and was now despised by a global audience with millions of people attacking her online. Justine's tweet overwhelm your timeline. Yeah, everybody, me, me too. I was in London lying in bed. And I thought what everybody else thought, which was, uh, wow, somebody's fucked. <laughs> um, so sat up in bed. Then I thought, I'm not certain that that was intended to be a racist tweet. John Ronson was so unnerved by the public response to Justine Sacco's tweet that he went to see her. When I met Justine a couple of weeks later, just crushed and broken and mangled up, I asked her to explain the joke, and she said, living in America puts us in a bit of a bubble when it comes to what's going on in the third world. I was making fun of the bubble. And then came the trolls. I'm actually kind of hoping Justine Sacco gets AIDS, lol. Somebody else that night wrote, somebody HIV positive should rape this bitch, and then we'll find out if her skin colour protects her from AIDS. And you know what? Nobody went after that person that night. We were all so thrilled to go after Justine. You know, we were so happy to be destroying Justine. We didn't have enough space in our brains to destroy somebody who was inappropriately destroying Justine. So that person got a free ride. With a public shaming, you are being told by hundreds of thousands of lovely people that you are worthless. And the people who I met were, who were really crushed, traumatised, depressed. A smattering of trolls may have said, we're going to rape you and kill you. But what really killed those people was, was our righteousness. The line between bad behaviour and trolling is blurring. And as Britain's most notorious troll, Isabella Sorley, has found out, the consequences are profound. She spent 12 weeks in jail for sending six threatening tweets after a night of binge drinking. 20 minutes is still defining my life, which, again, I struggle to, to cope with that because it, it was such a short period of time. And it's all, I'm always going to have that stigma attached that I'm that Twitter, that the Twitter girl. She's sorry for what she did, but she's not sure the punishment fit the crime. I think, obviously, what I sent, if you'd said it face to face, you, you're going to get in problem. I don't think I would have got prison. I was definitely made an example of because of how high profile it was. Isabella would like to apologize to her victim face to face one day, but a lifetime restraining order means that likely won't happen. Today, she works with youth to educate them about the dangers of alcohol abuse, which she believes ignited her trolling behavior. But for now, and likely forever, Isabella will have to live with the very public and criminal consequences of her online actions. Free speech advocate and journalist Brendan O'Neill doesn't mince words. He thinks Britain is creeping closer to a 1984 George Orwell police state when it comes to what can or cannot be said in society. He sees trolls as a scapegoated minority, pawns in a game where much more is at stake. We present the trolls as powerful and the, tr and, and the trolled as these kind of victims I think it's the other way around. I think troll hunters, the people, the, usually the media people who present themselves as these brave warriors against offensiveness on the internet, they are the greatest threat to the internet. They are the ones undermining the freedom of the internet, the accessibility of information, the right of people to express themselves. 
And it's the trolls, the, the sad man or woman stuck in their bedroom talking rubbish on the internet, they are the victims. As governments legislate to deal with trolling, there may be unintended consequences for everyone who communicates online. And my concern with the way in which trolling is discussed today is that everything gets conflated. So you have a situation where trolling can be everything from someone issuing a death threat, which is obviously a serious thing to do, to someone writing an article saying, I don't think climate change is the biggest problem facing humanity. Everything gets lumped together as trolling. And if you believe in freedom of speech, as I do, you should be outraged by the arrest not to mention the imprisonment of someone simply for expressing an idea. 6,000 kilometers away in Toronto, Canada, after three years of being forced off the internet, having his artwork vandalized, and wondering if he would go to jail for the tweets he sent, the verdict in Gregory Allen Elliott's case is finally handed down. He is innocent of all charges. The judge says his tweets contained nothing of a violent or sexual nature, and there was no indication that he intended to hurt his accusers. I was not doing anything wrong, and I was, you know, protecting myself and my freedom of speech, and, uh, and I wasn't going to be bullied or intimidated by people that were trying to protect the world from bullies and intimidators, you know, <laughs> for lack of a better word, you know? Gregory has his freedom, but he's paid a heavy toll for the speech his opponents considered trolling. The emotional toll is brutal. It's brutal, you know? And the, the monetary, the money and stuff. I lost my job of 17 years. Um, I had to cash out my pension. Absolutely destroyed me financially. Destroyed me financially. Gregory's reputation has also been damaged. Even his most abrasive tweets pale beside the trolling he received at the hands of the Twitter mob. Even though he was in the right, there is a permanent record that's going to follow him on the internet of Mr. Elliott being labeled as a men's rights activist, a misogynist, and a pedophile. And I guarantee you one thing, nobody who accused him of being those three things is going to apologize Gregory's detractors say that misogyny won, and the most vicious anti-feminist trolls see his acquittal as a victory. Tragically, this case has done nothing to make discourse on the internet any better. Meanwhile, back in Chicago, blogger Gina Crossley Corcoran is tired. Despite the validation she gets from her feminist breeder community, the trolls are wearing her down. Constant snarky comments, cruel pranks, threats against her family, and late night police intrusions. She's learned to manage it, but it's exhausting. I wish that people would use the internet more as a buffet. Just take what you want and leave the rest, as opposed to feeling like, Anything that doesn't apply to them or anything that they're bothered by is a reason to go on the offensive. You know, when I go to the buffet, I, I like the chicken and I like the mac and cheese, but I'm not insulted by the other things that are there that are, might be useful for other people and other people might find palatable. I'm just like, yeah, those aren't for me, and I walk away. I don't like go up to the manager and scream, how dare you have this available at your buffet? It doesn't personally meet my needs. But I feel like a lot of people on the internet, that, that's exactly the way that they react. Will this new psychological phenomenon of trolling ever end? The answer is likely no. Instead, we need to gain the tools to recognize how to fight trolling and recognize how not to become trolls ourselves. Perhaps ironically, notorious troll Wild Goose advocates for anonymity and cautions that our real physical lives should be kept off the internet altogether. People need to disassociate themselves from their internet persona. I, I think it's dangerous to uh, sort of plug your personality into the internet. You're leaving yourself open to a lot of dangerous actors, more dangerous people than the Bill Wagner crew. Privacy is just as big of an issue as freedom of speech. 
They go hand in hand. We think of our real world physical lives as distinct from our online activity, but that separation is rapidly breaking down. The biggest challenge we face as we adapt to this change is maintaining our freedoms in the digital space. Freedom of speech may be the most difficult to transition. For the first time in human history, the masses can express their opinions in a published forum. I think that's a wonderful thing, and my concern with troll hunting is that it's undermining that democratic breakthrough. Physical threats should never be tolerated. But we may need to ensure that others have the right to disagree with us, insult us, even hate us online. If we are serious about freedom of speech, then we have to allow people to say hateful, obnoxious, racist, sexist things. Freedom of speech covers all forms of speech.